So I'm Lisa Pierce, and I am a sociologist of religion, and also um, I study families. Those are my main interests, and so over time I've combined that to think about um, how youth grow up in families and what their religious lives are like, what their families are like religiously, um, what happens over time in the transition to adulthood. Um, and primarily in the U.S., I also do research in Nepal, so it makes for an interesting comparison um, between what's primarily Christian religions in the U.S. and in Nepal, it's mostly Hinduism, but also Buddhism as well. Um, so, how did you come about this? Like, what was you know what drew you to to your field? So. I was always interested um, in college. I really enjoyed the sociology classes and kind of thinking about um, the worlds that people live in and, and what shapes their life. And um, I grew up in a religious family, and so thinking about um, how my life was different than people who didn't grow up in a religious family, um, but also, I mean, other characteristics of my parents that may have varied within that community of friends that we had and how that influenced me and shaped me as a person. I think made me curious about these issues and um, probably led to my focus on these topics. Great, thank you. I'm Melinda Denton and I'm an assistant professor of sociology at Clemson University and I've been studying um, my general research interests, similarly so this intersection of religion and family life and I've been interested in how does religion shape people's family lives and how do their family commitments um, shape their religious involvement. And I got involved in the National Study of Youth and Religion at the beginning um, in 2000 and so since then I've focused on adolescents and how their religious lives are shaped by um, their, their social context but also then the influence that, that religion has in their lives and in their relationships with their parents and um, other types of outcomes. And so what brought you to this field? Um, well, like Lisa, I enjoyed my sociology classes as, a, <laughs> as an undergrad, and I studied, uh, spent one summer studying um, under Roger Finke, who is a sociologist of religion, who's, mm -hmm. um, and, and so that sort of helped me combine my interest in, in sociology and family with this um, issue of religion, and so I went to UNC to study under Chris Smith, and as they say, the rest is history. So I, I got involved <laughs> with the National Study of Youth and Religion with Chris and just kind of have stayed involved with it since then. Excellent. About um, theology, um, how does that make a difference for any of these different five categories and groups? I mean, you know, from the different faiths that, sure. that you've encountered, how they understand. So I think maybe the most distinctive group is the abiders. To the extent we could look at aspects of theology and what they believe, they tended to be um, a little more exclusive in terms that we use the term exclusive in sociology of religion, meaning um, they do, for the most part, believe um, that you shouldn't be able to sort of pick and choose your beliefs, that if you belong to a certain religion, you should follow um, everything in that. And they're also more likely to feel that there's one true religion um, in the world. So there was a survey question about if you think there's one true religion or many religions have truth in them or no religions have truth in them, and they scored pretty high on that one true religion. And also um, in terms of um, religious affiliation in that abider group, um, there are quite a few of the more um, conservative or evangelical Protestant denominations represented compared to the other mm -hmm. um, cat other five profiles of so. young people today. I think one of the main things that comes out of this book is this identification of the five different religious profiles. And mm -hmm. for practitioners, I think that's important because um, we you know, we tend to think about religiosity sometimes in binary terms, you know, someone's religious or they're not, and what we show in the book is the complexity um, of how different youth are, are packaging the different elements of religion and that it's not all or nothing and that they are wrestling with these different things in different ways. And so I think just in understanding where youth are coming from helps people understand how to address the, the particular needs that they have.
we did something like the religious profiles because there is, you know, for a long time, um, sociologists of religion have used these sort of traditions, um, affiliate, you know, mainline, conservative, Catholic, J Jewish, um, but there's so much variation within those groups that it, it doesn't always tell us a lot about what, what mm -hmm. their lives look like um, to be affiliated with a you know, particular um, religious tradition. So I, I think while there are correlations with, with theology or, or theological traditions, one of the things we found even in the, the Soul Searching book is that mm -hmm. a lot of these themes really run across all the traditions. and. Um, maybe something coming out of the whole project. If you take all three books combined, mm -hmm. Souls in Transition, um, Faith of Their Own, and um, Soul Searching, is this this sense that theological particularity is somewhat lost, um, at least in this generation. I, you know, we don't have data on adults, but the youth themselves can't really talk about theological particularity. They, they mm -hmm. aren't really sure what it means to be Lutheran or, um, you know, Methodist or whatever, they, their version or their understanding of their faith is about what it means to me and what, um, you know, how how close I feel to God, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not very conversant on those theological issues. So it makes sense then that um, we don't see real, you know, strong correlations between theology and, and the profiles. Would you agree? Um, you talked a lot about moralistic therapeutic deism. Mm -hmm. What has happened with that in the second wave? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, do you you still see? Is that still very clearly where they're at? What they believe? <laughs> we, haven't, yeah, we haven't talked much about it. I I do think that um, it's still. I think I don't think it went away. I mean, I think that's still how people how these you frame it. We didn't focus on that in particular with the second wave. Um, I do know that in Souls in Transition, looking at the third wave, um, you know, they don't see as much of the, those themes coming out. Um, but I think the general idea that religious particularity is is not consistent, or, you know, is not something that they have a lot of language to talk about. You know, still becomes even more apparent in the. Third it does seem like it's an undercurrent in a lot of the groups. I think we just sort of took a different angle. And um, the m nice thing about moral therapeutic deism is it kind of gives the concept in a way to understand a large part of the population of that mm -hmm. age group. Um, and so we're then trying to kind of break down and look at other things. But it's kind of it's an undercurrent in especially, I'd say, the groups that are kind of in the middle, as we say, um, between somehow um, abiders and atheists because they're kind of using that, you know, whatever works for me and trying to mm -hmm. mold their faith um, in a way that often sounds similar to the narrative of moral therapeutic deism.